Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please allow us to quickly introduce ourselves. Uh, so, for those who don't know already, this is Michael Durig, our colleague from uh, Adobe Basel, and he likes to spend his time working on the TireMK, improving and optimizing things there. So, he is kind of building the test that I have to test. And I'm on stage with Valentin Olteanu. He is um, working for Adobe in QE, which I guess makes you the guy who tests what I built. Right. So in this session, we aim to explain and illustrate how different system resources, such as CPU, memory, or uh, the disk, are used by the term K. And we will focus a little bit on the effective deployments and um, operations. So before we start, I would quickly like to see how many of you have felt that their instance is super, super slow and have thought that this is because of the time K. So if I can see some, some hands. OK, yeah, I see quite some hands. Right, so basically, this as I hope that at the end of this session, you will be able to better understand uh, why this happened and how you could have avoided it and how you will be able to avoid it in the future. I think for the others, it's also helpful to prepare for when this is going to happen. So to quickly um, see how we have structured the presentation, uh, Michael, we start with an introduction on the TarnK, how it works and what's it, what is its role in, uh, in the full AM stack. Uh, and then he will do a deep dive into the TireMK and the internals and how each of its parts are using which resources. And I suggest to really pay attention because he will give some really useful tips um, around monitoring. I will then come and show you how you can use this information uh, to determine the health state of your system. And I will also uh, show a, a real life example, a test that uh, we've uh, created to reproduce a uh, typical problem. Um, at the end, we will uh, quickly give an overview on areas of improvement in TireMK and, it's, and what it's going to be um, our focus um, for, for this part. So, Michael? OK. Thank you, Valentin. Um, so I wanted to start off um, with putting things a little bit into perspective before we actually dive into um, system resources and the resource usage of the time K. So what is a time K? How does it relate to Oak and, and AEM as a whole? Um, in a typical stack, it looks more or less like this. There ha you have um, a JRE at the bottom, you have AEM at the, at the top, and in the middle you have um, a Sling, you have the servlet engine, you have OSGI. Um, as a piece of infrastructure. And then there is the content repository, the yellow box here. This is the place where your content is stored. It's a database for storing your web content, um, your assets, like your everything. Looking into that box, um, that box nowadays is implemented by Apache Chagrabbit Oak, um, an implementation of the JCR specification, the Java content repository specification. So in, on the top, it exposes that API, the JCI API. In the middle, there is the big um, box, Oak Core, where all the heavy lifting takes place, all the nice features you're probably um, using all the time, versioning, access control, and so on, are implemented. And then on the bottom of that stack, there is um, various options for actually persisting your data to a backend. There's an option for um, RDBMS, there's an option for Mongo, and then there is an option, the TarMK, for storing your data on your local box on the file system in a set of tar files. And this is a kind of deployment we are going to talk about um, during the rest of this presentation. So what is the TarMK? The TarMK is an embedded database for co-located co deployments. It is um, a hierarchical database. It is fast. It is small. However, it is limited to scale vertically with your box you are deploying it on. 
Implementation-wise, it follows an MVCC approach to concurrency, something I'm not going to talk about much more in this presentation. Please refer to the presentation I've given last year, same time, same place, um, where I focused much more on the working of the TMK. Um, for this presentation today, it is sufficient to think of it as an append-only store where everything you do over the JCR API ends up being written to disk as a record appended to a list of records that have been already written to disk before. So every node, every item, every property you modify ends up as a record on disk, potentially referencing earlier records on disk for, on one side, data deduplication, on the other side, marking things as being deleted because we are not modifying anything, we're just appending all the way. So once a certain number of records on di are on disk, we collect them inside um, a segment, a segment being, in a way, the smallest persistible unit on disk. Um, the things you actually see if you look inside the tar files are these, uh, these segments. From there on, things go on like normal. We keep appending, um, referencing older stuff. Now, one important bit to already um, mention at this point is that these records might become unrefer unreferenceable at some point from the current head, head state of the repository. They might become garbage at that point, but because we are only ever appending um, they still around, they still consume system resources, namely disk space, they still um, consume virtual memory, we're going to see in the next slide, and they still consume I.O. In some, in some sense, as we are going to show in Valentin's case study later on. So th the segments themselves, they are collected inside the tar files, appended to the last latest tar files as they come along, um, with new fa tar files being created on the fly once the previous one is full, which is at 256 megabyte at default. Now, the tar files, they are mapped into memory on your box, so they consume virtual memory, and they need to be loaded into physical memory at some point where you actually access them. So that, via that mechanism, everything that is garbage, every record that is in a, gar in a tar file that is not used anymore, still consumes virtual memory, and it might still consume physical memory, actually, when it is loaded um, along with some other records that you actually still can reference. And with that also um, consumes I.O. bandwidth on your box. So this just covers enough um, of the bit of inner working of the TMK to look at how the TMK uses system resources and um, to do that, we're actually looking at the typical operation, a write operation, and what a write operation does to your system. So a write operation consists of um, roughly three phases, a change phase, a save phase, and a persist phase. The change phase is where your changes are transiently accumulated inside your session, the JCR session. The save phase is the phase where these changes are actually being prepared for being persisted in the last phase where they are being made persist, persisted in an atomical way. So <coughs> let's zoom a little bit into each of these phases. The change phase, the change phase starts at the point where you acquire a session through um, login. And every change you're doing to that session, every node, every property you're modifying, you're adding, um, Will be, uh, will be accumulated inside that session first transient, transiently on the heap of your JVM. And at a certain point, these changes, once the number of changes reach a, th a certain threshold, the changes are flushed to disk in an actual real write-ahead manner. So this flashing doesn't go into a temp file or anything. It actually writes into the records already, so it's a, a real write-ahead operation. This has two interesting consequences. One, it frees up memory on the heap in your JVM, which needs to be reclaimed by the Java garbage collection process at some later time, so putting some additional load on the Java garbage collector. And 
quite dually to that, it also creates some fragmentation at some point on the records, the stuff that has been written ahead to disk, which will need, which will have to be cleaned up later on by the revision cleanup process, so the time case garbage collection process at some point. So in summary, the change phase <coughs> requiring RAM memory both on heap and off heap for acquiring, for, for accumulating the transient changes and disk for writing them ahead once, they, once the number of changes um, reach a certain threshold. The subsequent save phase um, starts at the point where you save your session, you call session save. At that point, the changes are put in form of a um, commit object, they are put onto a commit queue. Once that commit object reaches the head of the commit queue, um, all the changes are being processed one by one. Um, the processing um, takes care of validating no type constraints, checking UUID um, uniqueness, um, updating auto-created values, all these kind of JSON semantics are, in, are being applied in this process phase. That process phase is um, a serial thing, so each um, change is processed in turn. So the runtime characteristics of that phase is in the order of number of changes you have in your session. It's not directly related to the size of the repository or size of the subtree you're, you're operating on. It's the number of changes in your session. An interesting side note here is if, if you decide to throw your session away instead of saving it, there might still be an overhead from that because that session might have written ahead stuff on disk that is now garbage that will still consume disk space, still consume virtual memory through the memory mapping, and with that still might consume I.O. because things might be loaded into physical memory at some point. So in summary, um, we're using in this phase, you're using the queue for coordinating concurrent safe operations. We're using CPU for processing the changes and the disk for reading written ahead stuff back for the validating for the validating of the changes. Finally, <coughs> finally, the persist phase. The persist phase is actually quite small and quite light in itself. What it does, it, it updates the journal to point to the latest state of the repository, including the changes we just um, made. And then it dequeues um, the commit object from the commit queue, making the next item on the queue um, available for processing by the, by the um, process phase. The, the interesting thing to note here is that subsequently to the persist phase, not strictly being part of the um, persist phase, there might be quite some fan out by subsequent operations triggered by the commit um, after the fact, like asynchronous indexes that need to be updated, um, replication that is being run, workflows being triggered through observation events, looping back through your application actually, and all these kind of things that, happens, uh, that happen after the fact. Um, so the persist thread itself just um, requires this shared queue of commits um, for this um, coordination, but it can have quite a fan out on your system through subsequent actions that are happening um, afterwards. Now, this covers just enough for the what, what an I.O. operation actually does. Um, on a typical system, though, there might be um, a second I.O. operation happening at the same time, actually a third, or many, many, many I.O. operations, say, writes going on at the same time in parallel. So parallelity in general is limited by the availabili availability on resources of your system. So uh, for example, for the CPU, it means that you, ma you can never have more threads on your system that are in a runnable state than you have number of cores. As soon as you have more threads, some of them will be queued and will be scheduled by the JVM scheduler, which puts additional load onto your system. The same goes for the disk. If you have 
this guy or this goes into a queue and will be processed at some point. So for concurrent changes on the time k, it is the change phase that has actually the highest lev level of parallelity because s changes you do to individual sessions, they happen mostly in parallel um, on the th user thread, actually writing these changes, doing these changes on the sessions. But you might end up waiting for I.O., for example, when one session does a lot of writing, causes a lot of write ahead, saturating your I.O. bandwidth, another session might not be able to progress because it's waiting for the disk to become ready. On the other hand, it is the safe phase that has the highest level of concurrency because we have possibly multiple um, sessions that are ready to commit, ready to progress, um, but they're all contending for the same commit queue, waiting for their commit object to appear at the top of the queue, um, being ready for processing. So while this is like all the nitty-gritty details, what happens during a safe operation, which resources are involved, you're probably wondering, um, well, I've got a box and it's not performing as I want, and what, what is it actually doing? How can I understand what it's doing? We are exposing a lot, so Oak, the time K, exposes a lot of monitoring endpoints and the operating system and the JVM actually uh, um, even more that help you understand what the system is actually doing. Um, so first on the user side, this is the sessions. We have, you have the session mbean. A session mbean is exposed by each and every JCR session and helps you understanding what is going on per session. So how much read or write load is going on in a particular session. Further down the stack in the repository, there is the repository stats mbean. This gives you a consolidated view across of the load generated by all the sessions in your system. So it gives you numbers of for the write and read load generated across all sessions on your system. It also exposes some endpoints regarding observation, um, query performance. Um, not going to talk further about these in, in this presentation. Further in the time cave, you have the segment notes or stats mbean. This one is the mbean that allows you to monitor the commit, the commit queue I've been talking about earlier. So looking at then that mbean, you get numbers um, relating to the commit queue. You can find out how much items commits are waiting to be processed on that queue. How much time do they spend on that queue? Um, what is the rate and throughput um, on that queue? So you get a more overall overview of what the system is processing in terms of number of sessions. Further down towards the end of the time K, um, a consolidated view of what the time K writes to disk actually, number of bytes written or read to disk from the time K. So again, uh, another, um, another set of endpoints for looking at the same thing at a different point in the, in the stack. Now, outside of AEM, there is the JVM. The JVM exposes a lot of options to monitor what it is actually doing. One of the tools is um, Java Mission Control form or JRocket, which allows you to take flight recordings, recording pretty much anything that is going on in the JVM from threads and thread dumps, what the threads are doing, which logs they, they are holding, memory, memory allocations, exceptions, um, I.O which threads are doing I.O. at that point in time. Um, it can be pretty overwhelming, but it is an invaluable tool to actually understand your system and what your system is doing. Further, there is Command Line Tunes JSTAT for understanding Java garbage collection, fin finding out your system is busy doing garbage collection all the time. There is JSTAC for taking thread dumps, figuring out what the threads are doing, which threads are there what um, logs they are holding, what logs they are waiting for. And then there's JMAP for looking at the heap of the JVM. 
An interesting option of JMAP is it allows you to take um, class histograms, so instead of taking a full thread dump, you can quickly take a histogram of the number of allocations per class, helping you to understand what the system is doing without having to analyze a full um, expensive thread dump. And finally, there's the operating system. A tool I like to use there very much is VMstat. VMstat giving you um, snapshots of what I.O. and CPU is doing alongside other things at a certain point in time. So you can understand my system is very high on I.O. and I see the CPU at the same time is waiting for I.O. all the time. So I'm probably I.O. bound and my system, system is uh, some kind of thrashing and um, not healthy anymore. So this covers um, this bit. Let's continue with um, Valentin, who has a very interesting case study. Right. So please bear with me. I'm now going to try to show you how you can use those monitoring endpoints to determine the, the health state of your system. And I will also show you um, real data from a test that um, I've done to actually reproduce a um, typical problem uh, with RMK, and that's trashing. So to clarify a little bit what I'm going to talk about, um, this is the uh, Wikipedia definition of trashing, but just to mention it's uh, related to this constant state of paging of a system, which has to swap out data from the physical memory on disk to uh, free up some memory for uh, the applications. This comes, um, of course, with a performance penalty due to the speed of the disk. So now in TarmK, the notion is similar. Uh, the difference is that um, as Michael said, uh, TarmK relies a lot on the memory mapping file system. Um, so it's trashing in TarmK happens when your um, repository, or specifically the, the segment store, the TARS, do not fit into the system uh, memory cache. Uh, and this means that every access um, of the data needs to be um, actually um, it needs to go through the disk. So to visualize this, I've created a small animation, a really oversimplified animation, where um, let's say you have a repository on the disk and it is memory mapped, so it's, um, it can be accessed through the virtual memory. Um, and specific for this repository um, is that it has a bad locality. And it means that um, to, for example, to traverse a path in the repository, uh, the tar K will have to go through um, multiple TARs because the, um, the data is spread across several files. So this means it has a bad locality, maybe because you didn't run um, any um, revision cleanup recently. So what's happening when a request needs that data? Um, the, the system, so it's the operating system, that loads the data into the physical memory, into the cache, and then uh, the data is served uh, to the user, um, keeping the cache for future um, requests. If another request comes uh, and needs another data, and the physical memory is full, because you have usually a limited amount of, of RAM, uh, the OS will discard one of the old files and will load the new one. Right? So this is the basic concept of the cache. Now, when this pattern starts to repeat, you see how the disk starts to, to get uh, used intensively, and uh, this will result immediately in a penalty uh, to, to the performance of your system. So um, how uh, we, we reproduce this? We have designed a test uh, where we have, uh, on purpose, uh, we've chosen a machine that is, uh, has really limited resources. So we've... Uh, we went with 8 gigs of RAM, and out of which uh, we allocated 4 gigabytes for the heap. It means that uh, the operating system had really less than, than 4 gigabytes for the actual cache. The other thing that we've done, we've put a, a really slow disk to amplify the effects of the trashing, so you will to, be, to become more visible. And what, if, what we've done? We've installed an AM instance on this machine, and we've run a test throughout two weeks uh, with constant load, uh, something that tries to simulate the typical sites 
authoring um, use case. So it's basically creating pages, um, editing, adding paragraphs, activations, and so on. So as I said, we've run this test throughout two weeks. We kept the constant load, and we monitored the instance. And I will now show you a series of graphs corresponding to, to the relevant metrics. And you will notice a pattern uh, that it rec rec occurs in all the um, metrics, which is in the first week of the test, every metric is within normal uh, values. So everything is norm, which, uh, as expected, while in the second uh, week, um, things start to degrade. And you will um, immediately see how this, um, this goes uh, worse and worse. So let's start. Uh, of course, the most important when you talk about this is the, your uh, repository size. So again, we're talking only about the, the tar files, how big they are. And um, in our test, we started with around 14 gigs, just to make um, the, the problem appear faster. So it's already bigger than what we have available as, as cache. And we started the test. And uh, as expected, the segment store grows because of the activity on the instance. And um, um, online revision cleanup is triggered, so um, it cleans up uh, the, the trash um, generated during the previous week. So you see the, the peaks corresponding to the online revision cleanup run daily, and that um, reclaims uh, the, the trash. And this goes on for, for one week. Everything is normal until uh, this point, so the, the red vertical line, uh, where um, I would call it uh, the, the tipping point. And this, at this size of around 18 gigs, where uh, the performance starts to degrade. Um, what's going on? So the first consequence is, for example, that the online revision cleanup is canceled on purpose to avoid putting uh, extra pressure on the system that is already uh, on it, um, it's struggling uh, with the, the load. So you see here um, um, uh, an online revision cleanup that is canceled. The effect is that the repository is growing even faster because there's no um, space reclaimed. So we end up um, after two weeks with around 27 uh, gigabyte repository. How this is reflected um, on the disk IO, so on disk access, you'll see that uh, in the first week, uh, there's a low volume of uh, disk uh, I.O., and most of them are disk writes, which correspond to the persisting of the segments to disk, um, the, the segments generated by the load. You will see that there's almost no reads from the disk, which means, which means that the, the cache is actually doing its job. Is, uh, the, it doesn't have to go through the disk. Now, at the tipping point, if you look closely, that's exactly the moment where the disk starts to get uh, used for the reads. And the volume of reads, it's um, overpassing the number of writes, and it's just going um, higher and higher. It, it doesn't go back. Uh, it's, it shows a clear problem uh, with your system when you have this, this kind of pattern, right? Um, this is reflected also on the CPU. Uh, and if you're monitoring your CPU, you will see um, that, yeah, as expected uh, at the beginning, uh, it's partially used by the application, uh, but most of the time idle. While uh, once the, the disk starts to, to be used, uh, the red area, which corresponds to the timing, uh, the, to the time the, the CPU just waits for the, the I.O., it just goes bigger and bigger. So uh, this means that there's an impact also on the CPU um, level. Um, the consequence internally in, inside the, the, the TireMK is that the commit queue uh, is going to grow. And this is because uh, commits are uh, processed slower and slower. So they have to pile up um, in the queue uh, because the throughput is uh, getting worse. So you will see how the, the commit queue also shows this uh, degradation in performance. And if you're monitoring your commit queue, uh, uh, it, sh it should be clearly a, a sign of uh, alarm, right? Now, really interesting is that if you are just going to look at the memory and the usage of the memory, which might be the first thing you, you would uh, do, 
you will not notice anything weird. So from the beginning of the test until the end, everything looks the same. So there's no indication of this problem. Um, the JVM is using all the heap it was allocated, while the system um, is filling the, the remaining uh, memory with, with the cache, right? So um, watch out not to fall into this trap, right? The, um, the final consequence is that the response times um, are just getting bad, so it, mm, resulting in a really bad experience for uh, your users. And um, you will reach a point where you could basically consider your instance is not responding anymore. It's, it's so slow that uh, you, you, it, you reach a point uh, where it's uh, not uh, working. So you definitely you don't want to reach this point, right? Uh, ideally, um, yeah, you should uh, see where this happens and, and do, do, do something. Um, good. So I hope that you, you at least uh, got some ideas and that um, now you are just going to go and set up your monitoring system, going to look uh, carefully to all these things. You're going to even go further and uh, set alarms to be triggered when things go wrong. So you are just, you kind of just relax, right? But one day the, the alarms will start to trigger, right? And from the really calm state, you're just gonna start to panic, right? <laughs> Probably, usually this, this is what happens. <laughs> so first advice is to just calm down, take a deep breath, don't, don't panic because First, uh, I really, really uh, suggest that uh, you have to qualify the problem. Make sure this is the problem uh, that you're facing. Uh, I don't want you to go and um, have look at the disk and see high I.O. and say, oh, I've seen in the presentation there's a, the trashing problem. Because there might be something else. There might be uh, some asset processing that, go that intensively uses the disk. So make sure this is the problem you are facing, right? And then take some actions. Um, as you've seen in the graphs, there's no um, self-recovery. You, you have to do something to, to recover. Otherwise, the things uh, will go bad. You have some time, but uh, go for actions. So now you might wonder, actually, what can you do, right? It's there, there is a problem. You have to do something. And I will quickly show you two uh, solutions. And I will also prove that these are actually uh, fixing your problems. Um, and as you might have already uh, guessed, the first thing that you could do is to um, just upgrade your hardware. Um, as I said, RAM is very important. And ideally, you should have enough available physical memory to cache the whole segment store into the memory. That's the ideal case. But any, um, any addition to the RAM will help. The other thing uh, will be to just use a better disk, a faster disk, to just mitigate the effects of trashing, right? So optimizing maybe settings and so on. So uh, to actually prove that this is working, I've taken my, my instance that was already in a really bad state. Uh, and just uh, uh, it, as it was a VM, I just uh, scaled up the, the RAM to 32 gigs. Uh, so, uh, and restarted the test, and this showed immediately that it has fixed the problem, even though the, the segment store was already at uh, 28 gigs. So it worked really nice, and really beautiful uh, in this uh, slide is the, the memory graph that shows how the cache uh, is working. So. At the beginning of the test, it starts to, fi to be filled up by the segment store, and it reaches a point that is exactly the same size as the segment store. So it clearly, clearly reflects the, um, uh, the cache of the segment store. Uh, later on, when uh, online revision cleanup uh, is executed and uh, shrinks the repository, you also see the, the cache actually going down. So really nice. Now the other thing you can do is to look to the other um, side, to the other um, axis of the problem, and to reduce to control the size of your repository, right? 
And there you can think of, uh, first of all, if you haven't done already, uh, just use a fi uh, data store, a file data store, an S3, anything just to take the blobs out of the segments, right? So this, is, this helps in a lot of ways, just do it. Um, it's by default since 6.3, uh, since AM63. AM, AM uh, the other thing is that usually um, inside your instance you have a lot of uh, data that accumulates because um, it's, uh, it tracks different um, history um, of, of the thing. So look into cleaning up your, your old data. So you, there are a lot of tasks available. You, um, just to name a few, uh, there is the workflow purge, uh, the audit logs you have can delete, um, a, a lot of things that, that can help actually shrink uh, the, your, your repository and keep its footprint on this really small. If you have even uh, more time and you can invest even more effort, you can look into how you actually store uh, your data in the repository and then look into maybe optimizing the indexes and, and other stuff. So in my case, um, I've taken the original instance um, and so kept the, the small hardware. Uh, and just perform some maintenance on it. Um, I basically deleted the um, old content, and I also had to run an offline revision cleanup in this case, because the repository was so big that it could not uh, be started anymore uh, on that hardware. So you see here how I um, reduced the repository to around 9 gigs and started on, on that machine. And again, uh, the um, the parameters went really back to normal. So this also proved to be uh, a solution to, to this problem. Just to mention that the two solutions are independent, so you can apply both or only one. Just do anything uh, in this uh, respect to, to avoid the situation. So that's it. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so let's conclude with a quick outlook. So far, everything we've seen was about what can go wrong, what can make your system slow, and what options you have on your end to monitor and to improve the situation. Um, I wanted to conclude with um, areas impro of improvement on our end, what is keeping us busy or what kept us busy during the last year, and what we um, actually working on impro improving things from our end. So first and foremost, there is uh, revision cleanup. Revision cleanup is the currently the main utility to keep locality um, high, to keep the records close to each other inside the tar files and not smeared all over the places. Um, we worked on a new run mode or new mode for running revision cleanup that is more um, that that is not as intense on your resources. So it doesn't use so so much I/O, it doesn't use so much CPU, and is able to to finish quicker than the revision cleanup process from AEM 6.3. Further. Um, the commit scheduler is something that um, I see has quite a bit of potential. Currently, we are just handling the commits as they come in, in a FIFO manner. Um, it, I think it will be um, an advantage to actually look at the commits and probably schedule them in a way that optimizes the system for throughputs, let's say, instead of just handling them as they come along. That is something that is um, that is something that that uh, the commit scheduler enables us to do that we weren't able to do um, before we introduced that concept. Then on the monitoring side, we are constantly adding monitoring endpoints so you can better understand what the system is doing and working on these case studies. Valentin has been doing to understand what the data actually means, and we want to look into methods for providing you the information of yet um, now you've reached that vertical red line, you've reached that tipping point um, out of the box. That is, that is something else we wanted to look into. So this brings me to the end of our presentation. If there's any questions, we are happy to take them at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you.
<laughs> so, are there any questions? Plus one. I have a question regarding the other facilities to store your data. Do you have similar uh, information on how the response times, et cetera, evolve when using MongoDB, for example? Um, that would be my colleague, uh, Marcel from Adobe, who could help you with that. Um, we didn't do so much um, in the longevity testing, as far as I know, for, for MongoDB backends. Um, I know their revision cleanup um, has a completely different way of operating and a completely different set of problems. So if you're interested in more, um, I can put you into contact with my colleague from Adobe who can point you in the right directions. Okay, thank you. Yeah. J just to clarify, the values on the test are really a, a lab test value, so not necessarily a real-life uh, data. It's tries to, to simulate the data, but values are on purpose high or low. Or don't take it um, as a real um, I don't know, scaling uh, data, something like that. Um, I am still wondering if there is any chance to run tar MK optimization in 6.2 without actually stopping the systems? No. And what you, ex what you <laughs> recommend for that? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd recommend upgrading. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, the fix is in AEM 6.3 for um, actually running it online. Um, so far, there's no plan to backport that because the fix implied uh, migration of the content and um, Having an, op uh, having an content migration as part of a hotfix upgrade, that is a bit awkward. So that's, that's currently stopping us. Mm. Okay. Upgrading, okay. If that's the only chance, then fair enough. Okay. Currently, yes. Okay, any other questions? Uh, there's one in the very back, yeah. Hi, um, I'm interested into the phases that you explained before, uh, namely those uh, change, save, and persist. So what I understand is there is one queue which is uh, uh, actually the commit queue, and this queue has uh, um, also this save, uh, change, and persist operations of access to the same queue. So is it kind of a priority queue or can I say my scheduler that okay I want to get this uh, first commit as persistent? Um, currently it is a priority queue, it's just FIFO. Mm -hmm. um, but we would like to look into methods to make this more flexible so have a scheduling mechanism that would prioritize um, commits according to some optimization goal. Um, the only thing we are currently doing is very internally, um, if you set a checkpoint on your repository that is used by the indexer, for example, um, then that also goes to the commit, and that is a commit that we expedite, actually, um, to help the indexer making progress. Thanks. Okay. There's another question, if you could... Yes, hello. Um, is there, um, what what I need is uh, a stupid, simple thing to to figure out if we if this problem happens. And I think uh, uh, one good indicator is if the uh, online uh, optimization is cancelled, and is there a mechanism to monitor this uh, if this happened? Yeah. That's the end, yeah. right? Sorry? That's the ambient, right? You're, you're testing this usually. Um, yeah, so there is, an, um, there is a health check in AEM for the online revision cleanup. We're talking now 6.3 and plus. So there is a health check that you can monitor for, um, for this. 
and we'll show uh, when online revision cleanup was canceled because of low resources, right? Now, this can mean that potentially at that time when you tried to run, it was because you had a really high peak of, of load, right? Um, or it's because you are in a really constant bad state with your system, you know, in a, mm, yeah, undersized system. So um, how the health check is working? If there's one online revision cleanup uh, that is canceled, it's gonna become uh, yellow, so it's a warning. But if it be if it's uh, canceled two or three uh, two, two. two two times in a row, then it's really um, a red uh, warning. So yeah, you could use uh, this indicator to to determine that your instance is undersized. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so if there are any other questions, I would recommend to get to the both uh, of you while the next break or any of the breaks following. Um, or the playground session. <laughs> exactly, or while the playground session. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thanks.